Hassan Sorrells. This is the Leadership Lessons from the Great Books podcast, episode number 23, with our book today. This one right here by Dr. Forrest E. Morgan. From Living the Martial Way by Dr. Forrest E. Morgan, directly from the introduction. Perhaps the biggest misunderstanding among Western martial artists is whether the systems they study are martial arts or martial ways. To best understand this dichotomy, let's turn to Japan. The Japanese group their combative systems into two distinct categories. Those developed by warrior groups purely for use in combat are called buge or bujutsu. Both words literally mean martial art. Typically, names of those systems end in the suffix jitsu. On the other hand, budo, martial way, systems all end in the suffix do, way. These systems were developed from the jutsu forms, but are directed towards goals beyond and sometimes instead of combat effectiveness, where the bujutsu practitioner is concerned first and foremost with learning how to prevail in combat, the true budo aspirant devotes himself to a system of physical, mental, and spiritual discipline through which he attempts to elevate himself in search of perfection. Notice I was careful to say true Budo practitioner. The various Budo were developed by Bujutsu masters who aspired to modify and formalize their combative systems into vehicles for leading others in the way. Having lived and mastered the warrior lifestyle, these men and women sought to devise concise systems for training the general public in the virtues of warriorship for the good of society at large. To make their methods both acceptable and attractive, the combative elements were often toned down and sporting applications were introduced. Unfortunately, while the founders and early followers of the various martial ways such as Judo and Karate Do understood their systems were mere devices for practicing the martial way, most of their modern day adherents have lost sight of the way itself and instead wander aimlessly amidst the external trappings of ritual and sport. Although I use Japan as an example, the martial art, martial way distinction can also be applied to other arts from other Asian locales. The concept of way is a common one in Eastern philosophical thought. In Japanese and Korean, it's called Do. In China, it's Tao. In Japan, Jitsu and Do systems survive and coexist, but in some other locales, such as Korea, the original martial arts have all but died while their Do counterparts example Taekwondo and Tang Soo Do continue to flourish. But can an individual who studies one or more of the martial arts or ways or even plays at combat sports also study and live the martial way? Of course. First, however, the student must realize that any system he or she may practice is artificial. That is to say, mastery of it is not the desired end in itself, but only a vehicle towards that end. Second, the individual must be able to subdue the external gratifications of rank, prestige, competitive victory, and ego in general for the truer rewards of personal development. Finally, the prospective adherent must realize that the martial way does not start and end at the door of the training hall. It is a way of life in which every action in and out of the training hall is done in the context of warriorship. In America, many students turn to the martial arts to learn how to defend themselves from the bully at school or work or to feel more confident while out at night. Others belong to karate or judo clubs and follow the tournament circuit collecting as many trophies as their talents can win. Why would these individuals want to learn seemingly complex philosophical concepts or constrain themselves with ethical notions from past warrior societies? The simple answer is there is much more to be gained from following the martial way than technical proficiency and the external rewards of athletic success. A true understanding of the martial way opens the door to a rich heritage of ethical principles 
training approaches and esoteric capabilities that can enrich an individual's martial arts experience as well as sharpen his ability to defend himself or succeed in competition. But most importantly, the martial way is a way of living. It is a holistic discipline aimed at the pursuit of excellence, not just in the training hall, but at life. Its disciples strive to apply the way in every vocation, and its adepts tend to be achievers in any field of endeavor. This is what separates the martial way from other pursuits and makes it so valuable. Where one may play at a sport or have a hobby, one lives the martial way. There are lessons for leaders from the world of warriors that leaders, if they are determined to walk the difficult path of leadership, can apply to that path and can benefit from. However, leaders who are disinterested in leadership or interested in leadership only for the external trappings of title and status or the internal trappings of ego gratification and pride will fail every single time the tests leadership throws at them. Competency, mere competency, at the tactical aspects of leadership cannot and should not be confused with the doctrine of leadership that leaders should adopt. Nor should a relatively well thought out strategic approach to solving an immediate leadership problem be confused with the approach needed to live the life of leadership successfully. The author of our book today, Dr. Forrest Morgan, wrote Living the Martial Way, a manual for the way a modern warrior should think in the 1980s and published it in 1992. A major in the United States Air Force for 27 years where he served as space operations officer, he did strategic planning for the Pentagon and taught at the School of Advanced Air and Space Studies. He holds black belts in Taekwondo, Chung Du Kwan, and Hakiori Jiu Jitsu. He also served as the Secretary General of the United States Chengdu Kwan Association from 1984 to 1997. Dr. Morgan eventually left the United States Air Force and went to work for the Rand Corporation after retiring, uh, and he worked there from 2003 to 2019. At Rand, uh, most notorious for their secret military intelligence operations and their defense contracts, he did strategy research and analysis for the Air Force and other defense and intelligence clients. Dr. Forrest E. Morgan has been a lecturer at the Carnegie Mellon University Institute for Politics and Strategy since 2017. Uh, and he is now retired from talking about his book, although you can still find him online. And I'd like to quote directly uh, about the genesis of Living the Martial Way from Dr. Forrest Morgan from an interview he did with a guy named Matthew, no last name given, uh, on a website, ikigawe.com. That's I K I. G-A-I-W-A-Y dot com. And I quote directly from Dr. Forrest Morgan. As I said above, by the mid-80s, I had become dissatisfied with what Taekwondo had to offer. As a military member, I had met a lot of martial artists from other systems and trained with some of them. I had lived in Japan a couple of years, studied the language and culture, watched the local police demonstrate their empty hand combative measures, and watched the Japanese military train in their unarmed combat system. I had studied various Asian philosophies in college. As a result of all of this, when I returned to my home organization, I soon realized I was much more informed about martial arts, Asian history and philosophy, and, well, personal combat in general, than any of my peers or superiors in the Taekwondo Association, people who had grown up in a single style, swallowing the pablum about the supposed superiority of that style uh, that the organization fed them. Consequently, as I explained in the introduction of Living the Martial Way, I set out to deliberately learn what my organization was failing to teach me, technically, tactically, philosophically, and spiritually. Over the next few years, as I researched and learned, I enriched the training I was giving my own students, bringing in techniques from other systems, developing scenario-oriented street tactics, uh, assigning the senior students outside readings, and holding discussion sessions with them, often over pitches of beer. 
My senior students and I became a tight-knit group, something of an elite squad, envied by students at other locations in our organization and resented by some other instructors. It was an invigorating period of my life, but as my assignment at that base approached an end, several of my students became concerned. You've got to write a book, one of them said. We can't get this stuff anyplace else. I laughed. We had learned a lot, but certainly I didn't have enough material for a book, or <laughs> so I thought. A few years later, while winnowing away the hours on midnight shifts manning a command post at HQ Air Force Space Command, I began outlining my ideas just to see if there was enough there to call it a book. What I discovered was not only did I have enough material for a book, I had too much for a single book. I had to cut it in half. Close quote. This single book, Living the Martial Way, a manual for the way a modern warrior should think, by Dr. Forrest E. Morgan, is now listed in 2022 as being one of the top five most influential books in the martial community in the United States. And as the years go by, exactly 30 since its original publication, it only grows in stature as more martial warriors find it globally. And today on the podcast, we're going to pull apart some of it and talk about how leaders can live the martial way and apply the martial way to the facts of leadership. Back to the book, Back to Living the Martial Way by Dr. Forrest Morgan. We're going to read various selections from the book today. Uh, there's a lot in this book, and I would encourage you to pick it up. It covers everything from um, strategy and tactics and mindset all the way to the principles of nutrition and training, strength development and then finally religion and philosophy. We are going to focus on the aspects that I think are most important for leaders today. We are going to, and we're going to start in that focus by reading directly from Morgan's observations in chapter one. We will not read the whole book as usual, uh, just excerpts in chapter one entitled The Warrior Mindset. It opens with a quote from Gichin Funakoshi, his first rule for the study of Karate Do. You must be deadly serious in training. When I say that, I do not mean that you should be reasonably diligent or moderately earnest. I mean that your opponent must always be present in your mind, whether you sit or stand or walk or raise your arms. Close quote. Funakoshi was karate's greatest modern master. He was the man who raised the art from its obscure roots in Okinawa to public attention in Japan and eventually the world. As a result, more people are familiar with his name than any other in the history of karate. Although Fukunashi was a Fukun Funakoshi, not Fukunashi, <laughs> and we're gonna we're gonna do the words today. We're gonna do the Japanese words here, so <laughs> bear with me. Although Funakoshi was a great karate master, the source of his greatness and fame was not his physical prowess. Certainly, having devoted his life to the practice of karate, he commanded all the strength, speed, and technical skill associated with that art's mastery, but he had contemporaries who were stronger, faster, and perhaps even more skillful than he. No. At barely five feet tall, Funakoshi was never destined to be a great champion in any physical arena. The source of Funakoshi's greatness was his unwavering devotion to the training principles, ethics, and lifestyle that embody the martial way. Gichin Funakoshi was a 20th century anachronism, 
Born in 1868 into a noble family in Shuri, Okinawa, he grew up amidst the turmoil of Japan's emergence from feudalism. He and his family were uh, Shizokugu, descendants of a long line of samurai. This was a turbulent time for Japan and Okinawa. The last shogun had been removed from power the year of Funakoshi's birth, and the young lad witnessed firsthand the dissolution of the warrior class. He saw the special privileges members of his caste had previously enjoyed just disappear. Unlike most of his contemporaries, however, Funakoshi never stopped being a warrior in spirit. He began studying karate as a child, even though practice of the art was forbidden by the Japanese, and he continued to study under several of Okinawa's leading masters throughout, the, throughout most of the first 50 years of his life. This was by no means an occasional pursuit or a part-time study. Uh, for Funakoshi, karate was part of his daily existence, as important as eating and sleeping. Nor should we assume his noble heritage provided him an easy lifestyle with hours to devote to any pastime he fancied. For though the Funakoshi family were Shizoku, they were poor, and Yangishen felt lucky when he first found work as a school teacher, even though it meant cutting off his cue, a symbol of his warrior heritage. The fact is, Funakoshi was committed to a lifetime study of karate at all costs and at any risk. He worked long hours teaching school each day, and since karate was forbidden, he trained at night. Every evening, he walked several miles to his instructor's house, where one or more masters drilled him in kata, pattern movement by the moon's light, or that of a dim lantern. Often, he did not get home until dawn. Gishin Funakoshi never lost his commitment to training. Even during the last years of his life, while other octogenarians rested, Funakoshi began each day rising early, washing, and then practicing several kata before taking his morning tea. How different this is from the attitude of today's martial artists. All of this is in marked contrast, and by the way, then he goes through and talks about how there are different students in the West, and I want to pick up uh, a little bit later on in the chapter on page 21, but perhaps we shouldn't judge Western martial artists so harshly. Most of us weren't born into a warrior heritage as Funakoshi was. Many Westerners take up a martial art looking for an interesting pastime or a source of exercise. Others are drawn by the promise of a challenging sport, a method of personal self-defense, or a combination of these offerings. Indeed, martial training can provide all these things, but where the warrior and non-warrior differ in their thinking is in the way they see themselves and the way they orient and prioritize the art in their lives. Most Western martial artists don't consider themselves warriors. Certainly, many fantasize and play at being warriors while in the training hall, but once they step out the door, they return to their roles as carpenters or salesmen or college students. They are no more warriors than are arcade game players who fantasize themselves in aerial combat true fighter pilots. Funakoshi, on the other hand, bore no such illusions regarding his warriorship. Indeed, we can see a common thread between groups as diverse as Japanese samurai or the Hohrang of 6th century Korea, the warrior caste of India, the chivalric orders of a feudal Europe, and even the American Indians. In the late 1960s, when Carlos Castaneda studied the ways of warriorship and mysticism among the Yaqui Indians of America's Southwest, his mentor once told him, quote, to seek the perfection of the warrior spirit is the only task worthy of our manhood. Certainly, Funakoshi could identify with that statement more readily than the non-warrior Yaki or the typical American martial artist. Understanding and cultivating the warrior spirit is what true martial training is all about. Without this essential foundation, the martial arts student can develop physical skill, but little more. With it, the aspiring warrior can enter a world in which physical skill is just one of many rewards. And in order to do that, he talks about the two 
aspects that we need to get, that we need to address in order to attain this warrior mindset. First off, a warrior acknowledges his warriorship and then a warrior pursues internal versus external objectives. Let me read from Acknowledging Your Warriorship extensively. I don't like the term martial artist. To me, that expression implies an individual does a martial art among his or other hobbies or recreational pastimes. Once more, the focus of a martial artist tends to be on a given martial art itself. Learning karate or judo becomes an end rather than a means of cultivating the martial spirit. As a result, the student tends to focus exclusively on one discipline and justifies his narrowness by claiming it's superior to all others. Living the martial way means thinking of yourself first and foremost as a warrior. Certainly, you study and practice one or more martial arts, but you do so as a vehicle for developing your warriorship and honing your spirit. You might wonder why a waitress, bricklayer, or doctor, individuals neither born into a warrior heritage nor involved in the profession of arms, would want to think of themselves as warriors in today's society. One could have asked Funakoshi the same question. If you recall, the warrior castes in Okinawa and Japan were abolished shortly after his birth. He no longer had any legal status as a warrior. In fact, he was a school teacher by occupation. But that didn't change his identity. He was still a member of an elite part of society. Warriors are special people. Since they understand the concept of honor, they set their ethical standards above most of the rest of society. Since they pattern their lives around the pursuit of excellence, they tend to achieve in their chosen vocations. Why would people in today's society want to think of themselves as warriors? Because warriorship is an extraordinary and powerful way to live. Now, warriorship is not for everyone. In past martial cultures, the warrior caste was occupied by an elite few, usually chosen by birth. They were admired and respected by the rest of society because of their noble birth. Gone now are the days of inherited status. To achieve admiration and respect today, the warrior must set himself apart from the rest of society by his personal excellence. Where warriorship was once a birthright, it is now a calling. Start today by thinking of yourself as a warrior. Stop being a dentist or an accountant who does karate as a hobby and become a warrior who practices both his profession and karate to hone his spirit. You'll discover both your professional competence and your karate will improve. But true mastery in the martial way involves more than mere physical prowess and expertise. The master warrior is a man of character, a man of wisdom and insight. These goals are far more elusive than those regarding technical expertise. Elusive they may be, but you can begin the long road towards character development by learning to recognize and pursue internal versus external objectives. So what, right? I mean, you're a leader, right? You're a manager or a supervisor. You're leading a bunch of people. You got a title. Maybe your title is dentist. Maybe your title is head engineer. Maybe your title is chief legal partner. If you're listening to this, maybe maybe your position gives you status as a senior vice president above people. Maybe Maybe you just want to work on tasks and become more competent at them and you don't want to lead a team because, well, you're just tired of doing that. I agree with Dr. Morgan on this. Leadership is an internal practice before it is anything else. This is the reason that self-awareness work cannot be confused with low-impact navel-gazing or even worse, self-esteem studies. However, Leaders often rebuke calls to commit as the doctor or lawyer that Forrest, Dr. Morgan mentioned. Uh, leaders often rebuke calls to commit fully and completely in their lives to the slow, deliberate mindset changing behaviors whose benefits accrue over time to grow in self-awareness, to grow in a leadership mindset, just as a warrior would. Part of this rebuke is because there is confusion in leaders about the role of decision-making, which requires speed, for sure, 
and how that is impacted by performing the self-reflective acts that allow speed to decision making to be well, fast in the first place. In pursuing internal objectives against and over pursuing external status, recognition, and authority, leaders, just like warriors, are faced with the challenges of being ethical in an increasingly unethical world. Cutting against the grain of conventional wisdom and bucking the crowd to actually lead the crowd. But all of this is hard. And if a leader's mindset is not appropriately oriented towards growing in self-awareness rather than wallowing in self-esteem or merely navel-gazing and focusing on selfish pursuits, leaders, leaders, well, leaders will not grow in character at all. to the book, back to Living the Martial Way by Forrest E. Morgan. Long part here from Your Martial Destiny, uh, part of chapter two, talking about how to actually construct doctrine, strategy, and tactics. And I pick up from Dr. Morgan here. Every society throughout history has been comprised of essentially two classes, one consisting of those who were warriors and one composed of those who were not. You could argue that various cultures have had numerous classes, peasants, merchants, aristocrats, etc., and that modern society is composed of a multitude of strata. But the fact remains all of these elements can be categorized either as warrior or non-warrior groups. The reason our civilization has evolved to this condition is simple. Life revolves around struggle. It's this very struggle that has led to the development of the warrior class, for not everyone is fit for combat, and as each society develops and its culture diversifies, the onerous task of defense is eventually delegated to that select group of individuals most suited for it. Those individuals then proceed to prepare themselves for their assigned role, protecting their society. Warriors don't quibble over which system of fighting is the best. For them, the relative strengths and weaknesses of specific methods are of less concern than the overall objective of survival and victory. I'm not saying that the given quality of a given system isn't important. I'm saying any real warrior knows that no one system fits everyone's needs in all situations. All systems are artificial. They are codified methods of teaching and practicing given sets of skills. A typical martial art was born when a skilled warrior discovered a set of moves that worked particularly well for him in a crisis. Wanting to preserve that experience, he then refined those moves and developed a system to practice them. If his system had merit, it drew the interest of other warriors and the founder soon had a following. In each instance of an established style of fighting, what went into the system at inception was based on what worked for the founder and what he believed would work for others in similar circumstances. The founder and his warrior followers practiced the system for what it was, a specific method of combat they believed would work in circumstances similar to those that spawned it. Though some warriors specialized, they all practiced more than one art. They had no illusions that there was any single best style of fighting that worked in situations other than those for which it was designed. Given a choice, they never used an unarmed method against a swordsman or a pole fighting style against an archer. When your ultimate goal is survival, there's no room for foolish notions of one superior weapon or one unbeatable style of fighting. As time passed, many martial disciplines eventually fell into the hands of non-warriors, right? Who practiced them for sport, 
fitness or personal self-defense. Unlike their warrior forebearers, these individuals usually studied only one art. Unfortunately, that led to confusion in times past, and it's even worse today. All martial arts are based on doctrines developed by those who founded them. The term doctrine can best be described as a set of broad and general beliefs. For our purposes, I'm referring to martial doctrine, the doctrine of personal combat, rather than the many others, such as religious or political doctrines. The concept of martial doctrine is closely related to strategy and tactics, but the terms are not synonymous. Strategy consists of the general or broad brush plans for fighting developed according to the beliefs of a chosen doctrine. Tactics, on the other hand, are the specific techniques and maneuvers employed to carry those plans out. Although doctrine, strategy, and tactics are different concepts, the warrior's choice of a doctrine has a very direct effect on the strategies he will develop and the tactics he will use in combat. Let me draw on some 20th century military history to illustrate this point. One of the better known strategies the Allies employed in World War II was that of strategic bombing in Europe. This strategy came about as a result of a doctrine developed by Army Flyers at the Air Corps Tactical School at Maxwell Field, Alabama in the early 1930s. These men were fascinated with the many possibilities of employing in war that new technological marvel, the airplane. <laughs> Planes had been around since before World War I, but only in the late 1920s had powerful enough engines been developed to build larger planes able to carry heavy loads. In 1933, the first true bombers entered the Air Corps inventory and the officers at Maxwell were inspired. They developed the theory and given a fleet of huge aircraft carrying tons of bombs, one nation could pound another into submission by bombing its industrial centers uh, to rubble. They supposed that with sufficient air power, ground forces might not even be needed. The bomber force would pound and pound and pound the adversary until its industrial base was destroyed and with it its ability, to, its ability and will to wage war. This theory became the Army Air Corps' strategic bombing doctrine. As their ideas took shape, the boys from Maxwell took their show on the road. They presented a series of papers and lectures designed to convince the military and political establishments of the efficacy of strategic bombing. And despite stubborn resistance from the Army General Staff, they succeeded. At least enough so that by the end of the 1930s, we were producing the famous B-17 Flying Fortress, a heavy bomber like the world had never seen before. World War II set the stage to put the strategic bombing doctrine into practice and gave us a classic demonstration of how a doctrine, nothing more than an unproven set of beliefs, can drive the development of strategy during war. With the Germans controlling nearly all of Western Europe, the Allies were left to fight them from England. Doctrine became strategy as plans were drawn to bomb Germany into submission. Reconnaissance and intelligence provided detailed information on German industrial centers and the Allies resolved to bomb them around the clock, the Americans by day and the British by night. As the plans were put into effect, tactics were developed to support them. Tight formations were employed to make the best use of the bomber's heavy armament and prevent German fighters from singling out and swarming on lone airplanes. When low-level bombing proved too vulnerable, <laughs> uh, to anti-aircraft fire, new bomb site technology was developed and high altitude bombing was employed. With the demands of war, heavy bombing strategy and tactics advanced years beyond what they would have in peace. And by 1945, millions of tons, by the way, side note, some of which is still around in Germany, millions, back to the book, millions of tons of high explosives have been dropped on German factories. Moving ahead a little bit in the chapter, as I explained, the genesis of warrior training involves finding the martial doctrine most suited to your needs. Based on your ability and the threats you may face, that belief system will become your doctrinal core and the art it employs will become your core art. Throughout the course of your life, you should devote the most time to mastering your core art. It's the one that best fulfills your strategic requirements and the master you train under should be your principal instructor. But now you realize no one doctrine is complete. So, once you reach the black belt level, in your core art, never before then, you need to critically examine the holes and weaknesses in it and find other disciplines to fill those gaps. As you 
begin developing skills from various doctrines, you must learn to integrate them into an effective personal arsenal. Our Taekwondoist, he uses an example of a Taekwondoist who is goes out and pursues uh, maybe uh, Jiu Jitsu or Kung Fu, right? to accomplish different strategic objectives. Our Taekwondoist should learn to blend his Korean tactics with those from Japanese karate. The Judo man should learn to blend punching and kicking with the grappling techniques of his core art. The final product should be a smooth fighter, effective at all ranges in any situation. The same for leaders, by the way. That's the point of all the resources. That's the point of the 400,000 volumes on Amazon. That's the point of when you go over to the business book section at Barnes & Noble. If you've been to Barnes & Noble recently, you'll note that there's a ton of books there on leadership. The point is, leaders build scaffolding for their leadership to climb, directing it as they would unruly vines in the garden the leaders who never integrate, who never study, the leaders who never move beyond doctrine or a system, well, they don't advance very far. And if left to just grow and develop, leadership, like those vines, will not produce a crop worth harvesting. This is where I, Pache Dr. Morgan, would paraphrase from him and note that there are no superior leadership theories, only superior leaders. Building a scaffold of leadership requires leaders to possess a rock-ribbed understanding of doctrine, strategy, and tactics. Building such a scaffolding takes years to successfully, emotionally, psychologically, and materially construct. It requires emotional intelligence and growth in engaging, listening, and negotiating with others. It requires a deep understanding of the self and an acknowledgement of weaknesses, flaws, and failures. It requires a gathering and contextualization of advice and perspectives curated and aggregated from a variety of sources. But when leaders want to jump immediately to the next hack or cool tactic or follow their itching ears to another doctrinal guru selling leadership snake oil, they arrest their own ability to build scaffolding that actually works for them. Understanding of the difference between doctrine, strategy, and tactics. How do we, how do we train our minds, right, as leaders? Well, Morgan has some thoughts on this, as you would probably imagine, in his chapter, chapter three. Train as warriors train. From his section in Living the Martial Way, make training a daily regimen. The warrior trains daily. Physical conditioning, technical proficiency, tactical fluency, spiritual strength, emotional control. These are the substance of his goals and the weapons of his arsenal. Every day he devotes some time, some amount of time to honing and polishing at least one of them. Some days he pushes himself to the limits of his capability in one or more to test his progress friends, acquaintances, even family, often think warriors are obsessed or compulsive, but that isn't true. Obsessive and compulsive behavior are, by definition, traits of individuals who are unable to control themselves. 
The warrior is just the opposite. He is the model of control. The warrior doesn't seek pain or fear, fatigue, and the other unpleasant byproducts of constant training because he likes them. But he knows they are obstacles between him and his objectives. His goal is to overcome them. And he knows that to defeat an enemy, he must attack. And he knows that to defeat an enemy, he must attack. It isn't that the warrior is driven. He is the driver. Warriors hone their skills constantly. And if you've achieved the warrior mindset, you're looking for ways to fit some sort of training into every day. That doesn't mean you have to suffer through a gut-wrenching workout every day. Proper martial training isn't brutal or relentless with only weaklings stopping to rest and heal. In fact, the warrior way of life isn't completely physical at all. A significant portion involves academic study. Warriorship demands a never-ending balance. Exertion is followed by rest. Physical development is tempered by intellectual growth. Even work and discipline must be balanced by play and release. As the non-warrior rests and plays, the warrior does as well. You'll often see them together, but the difference between them lies in discipline. The non-warrior rests and plays out of habit. It's what he does to fill his spare time. Warriors, on the other hand, have very little spare time. They lead goal-oriented lives, and their goals demand dedication. But warriors also know they must balance work and training with rest and play. They do so by choice as a part of their training. Warriors are always under control. As a warrior, one of the first things you decide is that you're here for the long haul. Reckless training will lead to exhaustion, injuries, and discouragement. He's not incorrect uh, about that, by the way. Um, this goes along with the idea that it's going to take you 10 years to become a leadership success. You better be here for the long haul. Then he relates an anecdote um, about uh, some training that he went through and how to employ Shugyo um, as a uh, in his training um, and how to withstand the rigors of Shugyo. It's worthwhile to get the book to read about his experience at a martial arts seminar as a 19-year-old Taekwondo student um, back in the 70s. Uh, this kind of experience still occurs in traditional martial schools today. Matter of fact, uh, when I pursued my own Taekwondo black belt many years ago, I went through a similar experience. Uh, as a young 22-year-old at the time, picking up with an idea in the book. He says, talking about Shugyo, this is my first encounter with a ritual observed in some way, shape, or form by every warrior society of the world. It involves hardening the spirit through severe training or some extreme physical test. The ritual takes different forms in different cultures, but they all have a common element. The warrior drives himself, or is driven, to a level of endurance beyond what he previously believed possible. The experience is both grueling and frightening, but the warrior emerges from the ordeal feeling purified. One who has experienced this kind of training has never, is never quite the same afterward. The samurai call this regimen of severe training shugyo, and one's very survival depended on his discipline in it. This truth is reflected in the maxim, tomorrow's battle is won during today's practice. But why would modern men and women, who probably won't have to face someone trying to cut them down tomorrow, submit themselves to shugyo today? Psychiatrist and jiu-jitsu adept, Dr. Alan Hasegawa, explained it best when he wrote, Paradoxically, in many respects, the need for shogyo is even greater in an affluent society. The poet Berriman noted that the trouble with this country is that a man can live his entire life without knowing whether or not he is a coward. He saw a society of complacency and ennui, which was a result of a life of shallow distractions and luxuries. In an affluent society, it is necessary to purposely seek out the challenges which were once a part of the daily life of the warrior. This drive to test the limits of one's own potential is universal. 
close quote. And then a little bit further down in the chapter, when it comes right down to it, martial arts are about one thing, fighting. And regardless of how much one philosophizes about developing character and walking in peace, if he's a true warrior, he began by learning to fight. He will spend the rest of his life honing his combat skills. That's not to say peace and character development aren't important parts of the martial way, but strength and confidence are at its foundations, and the warrior must learn to walk without fear. As a warrior, you will strive to live a life of Budo, but you should train in the ways of Budutsu. You must always strive to master the arts of personal combat. There is an idea that if you're a manager or a supervisor, you're somehow not a leader. There is an idea that leaders are the people above you in the chain of command or at the top of a very high corporate ladder. There is an idea that if you are good enough at your job of supervising or managing, one day you'll be promoted to leadership based on your competency in supervising or managing. And of course, at that point, you'll replace all those incompetent leaders above you. At that point, you'll have the power of position you need to make all those positive changes that have been driving you crazy, right? The fact of the matter is, just like a warrior trains today and practices today for the eventual tomorrow, you are a leader right now. The team that's been given to you is the place where your leadership is happening in real time. The team that you are managing or supervising is your practice squad. It is your daily training. It is the place where your leadership mindset, just like a warrior mindset, must grow. The fact is your decisions matter today, right now. The team is looking to you for insight about how to get through today and for a vision of what tomorrow can be. And fundamentally, and this one you might want to wrap your arms around if you're listening to me, fundamentally the fact is you are the only leader that your team sees. The team doesn't know your boss. They don't care about him or his decisions, at least not as far as it doesn't impact them or does impact them. And they don't want to hear your griping about him. Change your mindset to a warrior mindset about the titles supervisor and manager because your team, your company, and your culture, they desperately need your leadership right now, today. to the book, back to living the martial way as we round the corner here with Dr. Morgan. Again, I'm going to read a, a large chunk of the book here, um, starting with The Warrior's Way of Strategy out of, uh, out of chapter four. A um, lot of good stuff in this chapter. For leaders. Strategy is the essence of warriorship. It lives in the heart of everything the warrior studies, practices, and does with his life. When the warrior chooses an art to master, a career to follow, or a place to live, strategy lies at the root of his choice. The warrior strives to keep up with the latest tactical developments, but strategy itself is a timeless commodity. 
Sun Tzu wrote The Art of War over 20 years ago, or 20, 20 years ago, 20 centuries ago, which we just read on a previous podcast. Um, but its principles are just as valid today as when he used them to become the most effective general in early China. And he has a greater following now than he ever did during his lifetime. Not only is his work an important part of the curriculum of every major military academy in the world, but he's studied by international negotiators and boardroom executives as well. But soon isn't the only classical strategist modern warrior chieftains study. Another is Miyamoto Musashi. By the way, go back and check out uh, episode number 21, I believe, of this um, of this podcast, uh, where we talked about Miyamoto Musashi's A Book of Five Rings, his Goren no Sho, with the great John Hill, a.k.a. Small Mountain, at Great Interview. It's a four-hour-long podcast for a very, very tiny book. Uh, go back and check it out. Picking back up with Living the Martial Way, Dr. Forrest Morgan on the Warrior's Way of Strategy. It's remarkable how few martial artists study the art of strategy or are even familiar with these fundamental texts. Somehow, they fail to make the connection between military strategy and martial arts. They don't realize that strategy and tactics aren't just topics of interest for the aspiring martial artist, but should actually become the focus of his training as he advances in the black belt ranks. Unfortunately, few modern martial artists can even define the term strategy and tactics, much less differentiate between the two of them. Ask the typical martial artist about strategy, and he'll try to explain it by citing examples of kick low, then punch to the face, or fake with a quick back fist that shoot a reverse punch into the opponent's solar plexus. Well, I'm sorry, fellow warriors, but those are examples of tactics, not strategy. True, the word strategy is, usely, is used loosely to cover a wide range of skills when speaking in broad terms, but warriors should know the differences between the specific concepts of strategy and tactics. Most modern martial artists don't, and some don't have the first clue as to how to use those essential skills in fighting. One hot Saturday in the summer of 1988, I took part in a special class at a jiu-jitsu school involving black belt students from a variety of arts. During a workout, I was particularly impressed with the skill displayed by a fellow wearing a black belt in jiu-jitsu, and I stayed behind afterward to talk with him. He was flattered by my interest and enthusiastically agreed to discuss some of his techniques in more detail. That's impressive, I said, following one of his explanations, but what's the tactical application of that technique? I got only a blank stare. What tactic would you use to get the uke into a position into which you could capture his arm and apply that technique? I persisted. His face reddened, and after a moment's hesitation, he innocently asked, What do you mean by tactic? What indeed? You already understand the role doctrines play in fighting systems, so it's time to look at the basics of strategy. As you recall, strategy consists of the general or broad brush plans to put one's doctrines into action. Strategic planning is much easier and more effective if you break it into four phases. To develop your own personal strategies, you should identify your strategic objectives, collect intelligence, plan for environment, and program for engagement. So a warrior needs to plan his responses. By the way, this is under the section Identify Your Strategic Objectives. So a warrior needs to plan his responses, taking into account the threats, his capabilities, and the moral and legal constraints he may face to achieve a variety of goals. By now, you may have realized this sounds a great deal like selecting doctrine, and so it is. Strategic objectives are the bridge between doctrine and strategy, but where it differs is while in selecting a doctrine we're weighing and choosing beliefs that will guide our training. In identifying strategic objectives, we are planning how we'll use the capabilities in combat. We're deciding just exactly what we want to achieve in battle. Take some time right now and think, what do you want to achieve if you're attacked in a dark alley? Do you want to escape your attacker, bust him up, subdue him, and hold him for the authorities? Will your objectives differ if there's more than one aggressor? What about age? Do you react differently if your antagonists are adolescents rather than adults? A warrior should consider all these things in advance, not just for the dark alley situation, but for all circumstances he's most likely to face. I don't mean you need to make detailed plans. Real life rarely obliges you by happening according to plan, nor would you have the time to draw from a large data bank for the appropriate strategy in a crisis. 
but you do want to consider in general terms what you want to achieve in the various situations you're most likely to face. Decide in advance. That way, when the threat materializes, you won't hesitate in your response. The goal isn't to clutter your mind with detailed scenarios, but to free it for the task at hand. With your mind clear of debate or how strongly to respond, you're free to read the intentions of your attacker, free to move smoothly and thoughtlessly into defense and counterattack. Where non-warriors tend to freeze at the onset of conflict, you're prepared for confrontation. And you're even better prepared if you've already collected intelligence on your adversaries. In talking about collecting intelligence, he says, and I quote, intelligence is, crucial, is a crucial factor in all levels of conflict, whether between armies or individuals. In medieval Japan, strategists in martial ryu schools maintained, a meticulous, maintained meticulous records on the techniques and strategies used by rival groups. Often these records were so detailed they even addressed specific strengths and weaknesses of key individuals and opposing clans. As a result, each ryu was very secretive about its own techniques, strategies, and tactics. The more you know about your adversary, the better you can prepare to fight him and the better you can handle yourself once combat has begun. Become as familiar as possible with the various combative systems available to potential aggressors. Plan for your environment. This is a great section where he relates an anecdote about uh, going to a judo dojo with a sensei, and the sensei has everyone take off their their gi or their their uh, their jackets and then has them engage in judo without their jackets on. Sweaty and gross, sure to be said, but definitely a preparation for real life. And then he says, because this is the point about environment, you must plan and train for fighting in a variety of environments. I can't overemphasize how important this point is. What happens when a taekwondo stylist is confronted on an icy street? How does a karate man cope with midwinter confrontations when his attackers are wearing multiple layers of heavy clothing? Are you prepared to fight on a snowy hillside or in a heavy rainstorm or in thigh deep water? What do you do if you're blinded by blowing sand? Plan and train for these environments in advance, even as you collect intelligence. Know your enemy, know how you'll fight in a variety of environments and you'll, ready, you'll be ready to program for engagement and then program for engagement. Now you need to be planning how you'll defend yourself against various attackers. I'm talking about conscious strategic programming to smoothly react to a variety of attackers in a broad range of environments. Fantasize. Sit back and imagine yourself in one place or another and create an attacker. Imagine him in detail. Uh, give him a specific age, size, appearance, and disposition. Then see him attacking. Use using a given set of skills. How will you react, defend, and counter? This process is a kind of mental programming done right. It will establish certain pathways in your mind that will lead you to the appropriate strategies in crisis situations without employing the cumbersome, inexact mechanics of conscious thought. This simple exercise will enable you to automatically respond to any threat with the correct strategy. What's more, it will free your conscious mind to read your opponent and apply the best tactics to defeat him. And then finally, how to develop tactics. From the Warrior's Way of Strategy, Chapter 4, Dr. Forrest Morgan, from the book. Tactics are the nuts and bolts of fighting. They are the means by which you fool your adversary into defeat. Tactics are the tools the karate man uses to get his fists on his opponent's chin or solar plexus, despite that man's overwhelming objections. Tactics make it possible for the judo man to convince his uke he's trying to throw him in one direction, while he applies kuzushi off balances and throws him in another. You must develop tactics to be an effective fighter. Developing tactics can be as confusing and overwhelming as developing strategy, unless you approach the process in an organized fashion. Unfortunately, I cannot teach you specific tactics because they differ dramatically from art to art. Your tactics will grow from your doctrines and your strategies, but I can give you a step-by-step -step approach for developing the tactics that are right for you. As we turn the corner, I want to quote directly from Miyamoto Musashi, who he mentioned in the chapter. From his water book, 
in A Book of Five Rings. And again, we, we delve deeply into Musashi um, in a previous episode of the podcast. Go back and listen to that. And I quote, If you master the principles of sword fencing when you freely beat one man, you beat any man in the world. The spirit of defeating a man is the same for ten million men. The strategist makes small things into big things, like building a great Buddha from a one-foot model. I cannot write in detail how this is done. The principle of strategy is having one thing to know 10,000 things. Musashi and Morgan, separated by, gosh, (laughs) at the time of this writing, separated by almost three centuries, and yet they both have come to similar conclusions. Once the distinction is clear in a leader's mind between doctrine, strategy, and tactics, the path forward of strategy transforms from one of confusion and apathy, punctuated with brief appeals to uh, best intentions and hope, while inevitable reacting impulsively when surprised by circumstances, to a path defined by intentional planning, keen observations and thought exercises, and drilled repetition. To live and be successful as leaders, intentional planning is not an afterthought or a consideration for a later date, but instead it is a careful set of mental and emotional actions leaders practically write into their everyday practice. Keen observation, journaling, reflection, and thought become for the successful leader not luxuries, as they are often described by the hairy, distractive, reactive, and political manager or supervisor in an organization, but instead are critical skill sets to be developed with patience intentionality, and time. Leaders get out from behind the desk. They take on hard projects with high rates of failure, and they drill what they've gleaned via practical application and the collection of resources. They drill it with the team. They go into a live role, such as it were. They view success as transitory. They tap early and often. Failure as a genuine learning moment. They remove their ego And then they delight when the goal is finally accomplished, however long it takes. And then they lead the team to the very next mountaintop. Wash, rinse, repeat. history um, was amazing, and the ways in which he was able to integrate philosophy with strategic practicality based on his military background, his mode of thinking, his blue-collar upbringing, and his hard scrabble life make for fascinating reading, and I would encourage you to go Google him. Go Google Dr. Forrest Morgan. Um, Email him at Carnegie Mellon. Don't bother the man, but email him at Carnegie Mellon if you have any questions about the book, or you'd like to have him show up at your dojo. I believe he is now retired. We did reach out to him, by the way, for this podcast episode, and he declined to come on, Um, but that should be taken as no uh, knock on the man. I believe that his work, after 30 years, stands and speaks for itself across many, many disciplines. I first picked up the book in 1998 as a uh, as a young man who was just beginning my journey into the martial arts and just beginning my journey into leading a lifestyle, into establishing a warrior mindset, and that did not come easily, and it 
is still a work in progress. As a matter of fact, if you pick up my most recent book, the dedication in there um, means a lot to people who have been with me on this journey. But enough about me and enough about Morgan. What about you? What can you take from Living the Martial Way, a guide to how the modern warrior should think? How can you apply this to your life if you don't go to the dojo or maybe you don't even go to the gym, right? Maybe you're just barely holding together your existence as a leader. Maybe you're just barely holding your existence together as a manager or supervisor. Maybe you're just barely holding it together right now in a remote organization in the face of COVID along with everything else that is occurring in the world. How do you stay on the path? Hell, how do you get on the path? And how can this book possibly help you? By the way, I don't believe there's an audio version of it, so you're going to have to actually go get the physical copy of the book. I think the first point we can take from Living the Martial Way by Dr. Forrest Morgan is that a leader cannot lead others if they refuse to lead themselves first. If you refuse to engage in the work of self-leadership, if you refuse to reject self-deception, if you refuse to engage in self-awareness work, if you uh, refuse to walk away from the temptations of selfish motives or pursuing pointless exercises in growing your quote-unquote self-esteem, uh, you cannot lead others. Sure, you'll have the title, and sure, you'll have the position, but you won't actually be a leader. A leader cannot lead others if they refuse to lead themselves first. The second point that we can pull from living the martial way is that a leader builds a scaffolding, and they do it intentionally. This is the point of my third book, and probably the point of a couple of upcoming books as well, but a leader builds a scaffolding out of doctrine, strategy, and tactics before she or he even attempts to lead. Now, I know, I know. You're reactive in your day-to-day. -day. You've got 10,000 things coming at you. You've got a lot of different people asking you to make a lot of different decisions right now. So, the old Chinese proverb really does matter here. The two best times to plant a tree are 20 years ago and right now. If you've never developed a doctrine, which is a set of beliefs, if you've never built the bridge of strategy from those beliefs to actual practical tactics that you use when dealing with your team, if you have not engaged in this work, start now, today, right now, after you finish listening to the podcast. <laughs> Go get a notebook. Start writing down your doctrine. What set of beliefs guide you as a leader? What do you actually believe? Forget your title. Forget the corporate nonsense. Forget what people are telling you. What's your actual doctrine? And then, what's the bridge between that and the tactics that you use every day to address problems, deal with difficult people, adapt to change, hand out discipline, engage with performance feedback, build a team, and how do you think of your role and your responsibility? And on and on and on. Point number three, a leader trains for leading. Even if they are missing trappings, titles, status, or the authority of leader in an organization. I'm really on a kick, on a tear about this this month because I want you to forget titles. There is this idea that if we honor the hierarchy of the organization, that somehow with the title comes the thing that we are looking for. And then we're disappointed when either we get the title and we realize that that thing we were looking for isn't there, or when we are raised to a level where other folks have that title and we discover they don't have the thing either. Get rid of your title-based thinking right now. Abandon it. Drop that weight because it's holding you back. Look, titles are just about as relevant in leadership as medals are on a person's chest after they fought a war. See, the thing is, you don't get the medal before you do the act. You get the medal and the recognition after you've done the act. And if the medal and recognition, if the title of leader that you're getting is for an act you have not done yet, or it's because of a task you've proved competent at, 
then the challenge is to become more competent. The challenge is to go back to basics. The challenge is to remember that even before all of that stuff shows up, before the trappings appear, you've got to do the work. By the way, what that means is, no, you're not going to get paid for it. Yes, you're going to have to do extra. Yes, you're going to have to invest. And no, there's probably no immediate compensation. So if you're driven by immediate gratification, leadership is probably not for you. It's probably okay to be a follower. And please reject the promotion. Please turn it down. Please spare us your incompetent leadership if that's not what you want to do. It's okay. We'll find other folks. The last point from Living the Martial Way by Dr. Forrest Morgan that I think we can glean, the last idea I think we can glean here in this last few minutes of the podcast is, in order to stay on the path, a leader intentionally studies, designs, and executes on strategy and tactics. Uh, there's a great book, Leadership Strategy and Tactics, by a guy named Jocko Willick. I would encourage you to pick that up if you want more specifics on what Dr. Morgan is talking about in Living the Martial Way. But if you don't want to pick that up, that's okay. You can design, study, and execute on strategy and on tactics yourself. You don't need a fancy book. You don't need another resource. You just need a pen, a notebook, and your own thoughts. And when you realize that you're at the end of your thought resources, you are now officially at the beginning of staying on the leadership path. And that's something that everyone, regardless of race, gender, color, or creed, can do right now, today. And that's it for me. Well, if you liked that video, you should check out more by subscribing to the Leadership Lessons from the Great Books podcast playlist here on the HSCT Publishing YouTube channel. You can also get a copy of my third book, 12 Rules for Leaders, The Foundation for Intentional Leadership, co-written with Bradley Madigan. Check that out on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and everywhere where you get eBooks today. And thanks.